Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Dan. This Stone. is Dexter from the this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lab. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Jalef. I'm Chris This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. I'm Laird Hamilton. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Gray. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Peter Van Buren, author of We Meant Well, How I Helped Lose the War for the Hearts and Minds of the Iraqi People. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. It's been quite a while, my friend. I know. It has been, I was thinking about it, it's basically been nine years since we've been in the same room, something like that? Yep. Something like that. I, I have to admit that I had to think for a moment when, when your uh, message first popped up, like, who is this old guy who's contacting me? Who, uh, <laughs> unlike you, unlike you, I have not aged at all in the uh, the last uh, <laughs> few years. It must be that high quality diet. Well, I, I really kind of hearken it back to my State Department training. <laughs> you know, they, they just really took a holistic approach right? and, and, and clean living. And clean living. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with a little clean living. Man, I love this. I love this. So for the audience's sake, Peter and I go back quite a ways. We aren't close, but we definitely worked in the same the same building, the same office at times, out in the field together. And in for in this case specifically Baghdad, the outer areas of it. And I wanted to just uh, I wanted to have him on because he wrote a book called We Met Well and How I Helped Lose the War in Iraq. But he's also got other books, and we'll talk about that. But it's always neat for me to bring people that I've I've worked with hand in hand, seen the same kinds of things, and just kind of color in where things are at. Now, you are a bit of, of a, um, I guess you have to say pariah, you know, with especially with the <laughs> State Department. You've we're battled... going to talk about my personal life here? Or, uh... <laughs> well, I'm just talking with the State Department. We can get into the personal yep. life stuff, but uh, because you were willing to talk about the, the problems, and, and I, I, I don't expect to put words in your mouth, but my experience working with the State Department, there's a lot of arrogance, a lot of, of just... Uh, what I call accountability ladder problems, where you're always mm-hmm. worried about the person above you. What's the ambassador going to say? What's what's the secretary going to say? And meanwhile, you're a rocky partner. You're like, yeah, fuck that guy. I'll tell him what to do. And so this kind of uh, an approach, everybody kept coming out to, if, if you recall, the Green Medine. And it mm-hmm. was this model program. I would go around town, and I couldn't find evidence of it's actually working. So I wanted to come in and talk to you about what it means to publish a book that's contrary to the State Department narrative. And, and how you deal with that, how the heck you get published on what was it, it was Michael Moore's uh, <laughs> brand, and then the uh, what's the conservative brand? The American Conservative. The American Conservative. Oh, how do you do that dichotomy thing? Where are well, things at now, and all those things? A lot to unpack. Um, as background, I worked uh, for the State Department for 24 years, and as uh, Pete will attest, I was a remarkably mediocre uh, State Department official. I had no political ambitions, uh, no real po- no real politics per se. Um, I was very dedicated to my mediocrity, and only through the craziness uh, of the way things were working in the United States government in 2009 was I sent by the State Department to Iraq with the mission of helping reconstruct the country, re- rebuild the country, and win the war for the United States, or at least my little little part of it. And Pete was there as a contractor, essentially working alongside of me, but he was working for the uh, the Army, and I was working for the, this, with the Army for the State Department. So we were kind of like, uh, we went to different schools together. Yeah. Nonetheless, my initial plan which was very well thought out was I don't want to go to Iraq. I don't know anything about this stuff, but I'm going to go because I have to go. The the State Department had a policy then of voluntold. Mm -hmm. Um, Basically, uh, it was anyone who wants to ever get promoted again or ever get another overseas assignment to a place without malaria is going to have to do a tour in Iraq or Afghanistan. So who's volunteering, guys? (laughs) There I was. My plan was to show up in Iraq, do whatever my predecessor had been doing, because apparently, you know, he didn't get, uh, you know, hung uh, when he returned home, and keep a low profile and just get this thing over with uh, as painlessly uh, as possible. Like many good plans, that one lasted about an hour. 
when I first got off uh, the helicopter at this very uh, this remote uh, forward operating base, I had this all scripted out in my mind. Um, I was going to be whisked to visit the military commander of the area. And it all planned out in my mind that I was going to stand up straight and give a firm handshake and say, Colonel, I'm here to help you implement your reconstruction plans. I thought that would be a good start. And I did that. And he kind of chuckled a little bit and said, we were hoping you knew what the plans were going to be. (laughs) And at that point, I realized this was not going to go the way I thought. I transitioned from the original plan of doing as little as possible to a plan of trying to just do as little as possible and not look around a lot. Basically sign some things when I had to and and try to look the other way. And that bumped along with various degrees of uh, success. But over the months there, and I was there a a year, over the months there, I, I came to understand that it was a lot more serious th- than that. In the book, We Meant Well, it's full of funny stories of the stupid things we did with, with, uh, with our money in, in Iraq. I don't know if you have a, a favorite, Pete, but, but one of the things that I remember back is the micro-loan program. Oh I don't know if you were connected to that, but yes. essentially we had bag, literal bags of money that we were supposed to use to start businesses, and the plan was to sort of give them to people and by people, I mean ra- basically random people and say, here's some money, start a business. Yes. We're not going to ever come back and ask you any questions. Did you have another favorite or, or are you going to go side well, with me on this one? You, listen, micro loans is a great, you could talk about that all day long. You know, it, it's, <laughs> it, there's that. I also like the windmills of the Tigris. There was this uh, contract. Ooh, Do you remember the windmills? I yeah. forgot about that. I'm having PTSD right now. Yeah. And, and every kernel I encountered down there was like, I'll be the goddamn one that fixes this shit. No one's going to outwork this. And I'm like, would you please not put any effort into that and just let those things be? You know, like you're the only person in this entire area that cares about them. Yeah. And so these projects are there, and I document them in, in, in the book, and a lot of them are funny. They sound funny. They yeah. sound silly, ridiculous. And and that was kind of how I was trying to, to get through this was by seeing the absurdity in it and, and making black humor out of it. And, and that held me only so far. Um, and then a couple of things started to, to, to come together. The first is that uh, of the two military units that I was with, uh, three soldiers committed suicide in the yeah. course of the year. And a couple of others had um, at quote unquote accidents happen that sent them home that, that easily could have become suicide and, and were many times questionable in how, how accidental they were. And I began to realize that all this this good fun that we were having was taking American lives and that every day we had to go outside the wire to inspect one of these goofy projects or or to hand out a bag of money. We were putting soldiers' lives on the line to protect me. And we were putting their lives on the line for for, for nothing. We were wasting that, 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 that risk. At the same time, as I began to understand more about what we were doing, I began to realize that many of our projects were actually harming the Iraqis. They weren't neutral. They weren't silly. They weren't contributing to, to, to graft and corruption. Though they, though all those things were happening. Yes. Um, they were harming people. We drove up the price, for example, of veterinary medicines uh, by factors of, of hundreds um, when all of a sudden we started buying them up so that we could give them away. Well, the vendors figured this out and they knew the Americans had a lot more money, so they raised the prices. And then, you know, a month later, when the U.S. government's attention shifted to a different shiny object, we stopped buying them but the vendors kept the prices high. I found that as we were funding silly projects, we were not taking care of the basic needs and Iraqi children were drinking polluted water. And all of these things, the dang- the things we were doing to ourselves and the things we were doing to Iraqis and the fact that we were lying about the lack about progress, we, we were not progressing, all started this voice in the back of my head that... I guess we call conscience at this point. Yeah. And it started saying, you know, you, you need to do something about this. You, you, you can't continue to turn it into kind of a joke and, and participate in this. And in the middle of the desert in Iraq, uh, it's kind of hard to sort that all out. 
what I did at first was to talk to my boss who said, shut up, everybody else is doing it, everyone before you has done it, this war is already six years old at this point, you're not the first guy who's figured this all out, shut up, play ball, finish your year. That was not an answer answer to a call from conscience. Uh, Eventually, uh, I tried to see the ambassador, the head of the whole State Department mission there, He, uh, he was busy uh, all the time, every day. I finally got a meeting with uh, some, what's called the deputy chief of mission, the vice ambassador, who threatened to send me home and yelled at me and said, what you're talking about is not fraud or waste or mismanagement. It's policy. <laughs> and figure out a way to do this. Uh... Um, he sent me back out, and without much more guidance, I basically... Uh, took to drinking and signing enough things that people stayed off my back and out of my way. And I I finished my my year. Back in the United States, I tried to find someone in the State Department who was willing to to speak with me. They uh, said, well, you must have PTSD because everything's going well. Through a couple of connections, I actually had a meeting with some staffers from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, I brought all my materials with me, and they kind of looked at me like you look at a a child who may have special needs, you know, and very politely said, well, look, every report, every bit of testimony we get from the State Department says this program is going well. Why should we believe you? By the way, we don't believe you, um, but thanks for playing. The call of conscience did not go away, and in fact, intensified as I realized that no one really was very interested. And it was at that point I decided to, to put this together in, into what eventually became a book. Now, for the people in the audience who uh, are a little bit younger, back in 2010, when this was all starting to happen, we had just learned of this thing called WikiLeaks. We had just learned about now Chelsea Manning and, and her uh, her leaking We hadn't had Edward Snowden. The word whistleblower was just still very much uh, a fringe term. And the sense that the media was going to be your friend and publish information that was critical of the government just wasn't what the vibe was, if you will. Yeah. No, I I remember when uh, when Chelsea Manning did the release, one of the things that hit home and and you and I both were privy to the cables that were sent around was the Mm -hmm. arrogance, the insulting attitude towards the people that we were, I'm going to say, quote, unquote, partnered with. Like, that's not how my partner treats me. Now, this is a complicated problem. And when I read these cables, uh, I don't know if you recall, too, there was like a a full colonel and this got out in the news, but Mm -hmm. he would write these very derogatory emails every day mocking the Iraqis ability to plan. (laughs) <laughs> and he built up this huge reading list. And it was funny, but it was also like, like, I can't read this thing anymore because, you know, some of us are here really trying, you know, trying to help out. And, and you guys are, are insulting. And it was embarrassing for that guy. And eventually someone leaked yep. it out to the press. But, you know, and I was glad to see those things because we were not doing the right things. An interesting uh, sideline to all of this, and, and history is full of, of, of amusing little little twists in that. The forward operating base where I spent the first uh, six months in Iraq was the same forward operating base that then Private Bradley Manning was right. stationed at, sure. Bob Hammer. And Manning's office was across the hall from mine. And the place where, and I'll just use the current branchy, the place where she burned all those CD-ROMs full of material and and made the decisions to leak to WikiLeaks, that was all happening literally across the hall from me. (laughs) I was in her space all the time. I don't recall meeting her specifically, but I had to have interacted with her because uh, a lot of the classified material that I needed to read passed through that office. And to think that she was undergoing this same crisis of conscience right. as I was. Yeah. And yeah. ultimately decided to leak thousands of cables that proved uh, embarrassing to the State Department while I was sitting over there. I, I live in, in I, I wake up with cold sweats about what would have happened if she had come to me. Yeah. Early in this, because her actions took place fairly early in my uh, year in Iraq, and I hadn't yet kind of become enlightened, if you will. And I I really am terrified to think 
what would have happened if she came to me and said, you know, hey, sir, you're with the State Department. I need somebody outside the Army to talk to about what I'm thinking of doing. Yeah. It's a scary thought to me, and I am glad that I was my, – my, my courage wasn't tested at that point. Yeah, boy, no kidding. Yeah, well, and, and just for the listeners to know, we maybe sat – 50 linear feet apart from each other. You know, I mean, there were yeah. some walls in the way, but yeah, that, that whole thing, I may not have been in the building at that time. Cause a lot of times I spent out in the field, but I yeah. certainly, I, I was struck by, Holy cow, <laughs> that leak just came from our building. Yeah. And, and you're right. That if she had come up to you and said, <sighs> Hey Pete, um, you know, you're, you're, you were a civilian contractor. You're a civilian. You're, you're not yeah. in my chain of command. Can I talk to you about something? Is is uh, what would you do? Uh, yeah, I, I I'd never considered that, but you're right. What would I have done? And uh, as a counterintelligence guy, I would have had a very big yeah. because look, I understand that you can't breach things. And you have to be very hard on people that do. And and she went to prison for it, and and I'm okay with all of that. I think it's appropriate. But I also understand what what she did, and with those cables yep. and how we were doing this. If we're gonna waste the time, look, one of the things I'm always critical of Peter when I talk to people, especially USAID, mm. especially Department of State, when they say, "Well, there's so much corruption there," and I'm like, mm-hmm. "Do you mean our corruption or <laughs> their corruption?" No, 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 we're not corrupt. Like, well, we are bringing, like you said, with the medicine, we are bringing money into a system. And we're using our money to solve our problems. If that's yes. not corruption, what is? Well, and, and, the, and the corruption of theirs that, that we essentially created by flooding the system yeah. with extraordinary amounts of, of money. Yes. Um, you can't go into what is essentially a third world situation and spread literally billions of dollars around without creating opportunities for, for corruption. Yeah. One of the, uh, the, the most corrupt corrupt in corruptions that we we accomplished was that the uh, US government said that we could only we could not give essentially more than a small amount of money to uh, an Iraqi contractor we could only give moderate to large amounts of money to a non governmental organization an NGO an Iraqi NGO right and what we did in that, but of course, that was a great idea, and it sounded good in Washington, but when you get on the ground in Iraq, it turns out that if you need a ditch dug, you've got to go to a contractor, not an NGO. Right. So we created this business where every contractor in Iraq that wanted our money, which meant all of them, had to kind of become a, a pseudo-NGO. And the little teeny offices in these small towns that used to never, that certified NGOs, you know, that it was yeah. like somebody's deaf cousin's brother's friend's son, um, suddenly became the epicenter of corruption yeah. because they had the ability to say, yes, you could get on the American gravy train or you can't. And we created a whole industry around becoming an NGO um, that was very shameful. Yeah, but let me jump back to uh, to 2010 uh, when I failed to get anyone in Washington interested in, yes. in hearing about what was going on on the ground in Iraq, and I made the decision to to put this together in, into a book. And I had been writing all this down along the way, mostly in emails home to my family, incredulous emails that always began with lines like "You can't believe what happened today." detailing things. And so I had the material, the material kind of organized and uh, put the book together. And I was very lucky to find a, a publisher who took me seriously. Then I didn't understand that publishing books takes a really long time. It's like a year from when you say, okay, let's make a book to when it hits the bookstores. This is not like Harry Potter where they rush it out at midnight. And so during that year, I'm just working at the State Department doing my thing. And I'm telling people about this. My boss uh, at the time. This episode of the Break It Down show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. 
uh, I was in an office that, that dealt with uh, recruitment and testing. It had nothing to do with Iraq or any political things. Um, my boss, uh, turns out, he was a frustrated novelist who had been trying for years to publish a, a novel of his. And we had these lengthy conversations about publishing. And I would, as things happened, I would explain things to him or say, oh, yeah, this we just passed the copyright step. And now we're into the line editing step. And so he was fully aware of, of all this, uh, as were all of my colleagues. Right. And nobody paid any real attention to it until I wrote a relatively painless blog post for the Huffington Post, um, basically about how to get along with the military better. You, you were in the military, is that correct? That's Before right, you, yeah. yeah. Was. Well, I never was. And it turns out, what a surprise, military culture is slightly different from civilian culture, from State Department culture. Yeah. And uh, not understanding this uh, was a problem at first for me. And so I had kind of, it was kind of a funny little thing about, hey, you know, this rank thing, you got you to gotta know your captains from your colonels, guys. And anyway, this caught somebody's attention. And the article noted in the little bit at the bottom that Peter Van Buren is working on a book and the gates of, of hell opened on me. And suddenly lots of important people at the State Department wanted to know what was going on. Was I publishing a book? Yes, I was. Um, was it about Iraq? Yes, it was about Iraq. Ooh. And then summer came. They forgot about me. And then uh, the, bo the book started to, to circulate. Uh, the publisher started sending copies out to various people hoping to get reviews. And the State Department got a hold of a, a copy and went absolutely, completely. Can we say ape shit on your, on your show? I think you should say ape shit. Okay, it went ape shit. That would be, I don't like to use profanity all that fucking much, but I mean, once you, you, you realize that ape shit is the most important word here, they just went berserk and they immediately uh, suspended me from my job. Um, they let me come into the office at first and just sit at the desk. Um, <laughs> that sounds reasonable. <laughs> I'll, I'll point out that uh, if you're on a government computer which blocks access to gambling and porn sites, the Internet is just not as big as you think it is right. um, when you've got to kill eight hours a day. Yeah. But they eventually, in, in very rapid succession, uh, accused me of revealing classified material in my book, uh, which course. was absolutely not true. Right. They accused me of accepting money for government private money for government service. They accused me of, of, of crimes against humanity. I was dragged in through the security process. My security clearance was suspended. They then determined that I was a physical threat to the safety of the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, at, at that time, uh -huh. um, because I was a disgruntled employee. And they marched me, security marched me out of the building uh, took away my ID card, you know, like in an old movie where they ripped the uh, the uh, the rank off the uniform. Yeah. Took away my ID card and told me that I was uh, under a uh, order that prohibited me from coming within a hundred yards of the White House or any State Department facility, and that I should go home and await further orders. So I did. Took the subway. And <laughs> so I did. I sat at home for a while. Like yeah. two weeks, and they finally sent me a letter saying that uh, under the way the uh, government uh, personnel rules work, they were going to go through this long process to fire me. And if they were successful in firing me for national security violations, which they were trying to gin up, right. um, I would lose my, my pension and uh, my retirement and my health insurance and all the things that I had worked 24 years to earn. I want you to press pause for one second because I have to add this in. So your ultimate boss is Secretary Clinton, who actually had top secret on her email server, which is impossible to do without breaking the law. And when you take responsibility for it, as she did, it's an act of either omission or commission. doesn't matter if you know about it. I didn't know. So... The, you're getting the book thrown at you for something, and I've I've read most of your book. It's mm -hmm. not classified. The stuff that's in there, it's not. And and I don't know if you went through the review process. I imagine your, your I did. publisher. I did. Of course. So your publisher's like, hey, you have to go through the review process. So your book, they've had a shot at your book. And that's absolutely correct. All of this stuff comes down. If that's not punitive and vindictive, I don't know why. Why would you say that you would? 
compromise security when the book they've had any time you write a book as an author if you're responsible you submit the book for to the government to them to review it and go yeah everything in here is good they may have some changes i don't know if that's true in your case or not but most of what peter and i did was not classified and if it was the classification expired shortly after that whole unit left and it could, yes because it was all command driven the classification so i'm sorry i had to put that color in there no that's because, very important because yeah. it, it it's very important because the i did in fact follow through on that process i submitted the manuscript of the book to the the office in the government that's that looks for these security things it's important to emphasize that apparently the office that looks for security problems does not correspond with the the rest of the government who Thought, thinks more about sort of content. Right. Um, so they apparently figured out there was nothing classified in there, but they apparently are not good at understanding that I was blowing the whistle on waste, fraud, and mismanagement within the State Department's Iraq operation. So there was a little bit of element of surprise in there. Um, and I, I just want to underline that I was scrupulous in making sure that there was nothing classified in my book because I wanted it to have the broadest reach possible. Sure, yeah. And I didn't want to have what I was trying to explain about Iraq sidelined by an argument over whether this this line stays in the book or, or not. And, and let's and be honest, there's plenty no. of material to work with that is unclassified. You don't have to go down that route. There's so oh, much to not. talk about. No, and the, and the review process required me to make no changes. Anyway, um, so the book, come, so, the, so I get yeah. sent home, and all this is going on, and they, they tell me that they're going to have to keep paying me for not coming to work because the rules don't allow them to not pay me. Right. But, and I have to stay at home because I'm actually technically working from home, even though I don't have an assignment or any duties. And this is back, kiddies, in the days of landlines. Um, and in theory, someone was supposed to call me to verify that I was at home. I think maybe they called once or twice, but otherwise. That's a, this all went on until I stumbled onto, uh, she, actually, she found me, an attorney named Jessalyn Raddick, who saved my life. Because wow. the State Department was going to find a way to get rid of me. They, I found out later through some uh, discovery, legal discovery, that they actually referred my case to the Justice Department for prosecution. Jesus. Um, the Justice Department declined because they knew there was no real evidence. But as people may or may not know, once the government takes you to court, you lose. Yeah, yeah. That's you will expensive. lose paying to defend yourself. You will lose in terms of reputation. You will lose in terms of, of your heart and your mental health. So luckily, somebody at the Department of Justice was said, we're too busy this week to hassle this kid. Anyway, Jessalyn Raddick uh, worked exclusively with whistleblowers. And anyone in your audience who's plugged into this may recognize the names of Thomas Drake, Bill Binney, and others who were whistleblowers that preceded all of us. Um, Jess saw the sto some stories in the newspaper and called me up and said, you're a whistleblower. You're not a national security risk. You're a, you're, you're a hero. Right. Yes. I, I don't claim the title myself, but she then took on uh, pro bono representing me with the State Department, eventually brought in the American Civil Liberties Union, who agreed to address my case as a First Amendment issue to say that as a government employee, I did not give up my rights to publish uh, my thoughts, right. um, that the First Amendment guaranteed this, that the State Department was retaliating against me simply for exercising my First Amendment rights. And with her help and with the assistance of the American Civil Liberties Union, we uh, negotiated my, uh, my retirement. I wasn't going to resign. And at some point in these processes, you realize, you ask yourself, what do, what do I need here? Yeah. And what I needed was to protect my family, to protect my, my pension, to protect my right to continue to speak out so that I left without any kind of a non-disclosure agreement or something on me. Right. And we negotiated uh, my retirement and essentially uh, ended my 24 years of government service. Whatever knowledge and expertise I had was flushed uh, down the toilet. I didn't know crap about the Middle East or Iraq, but I had spent most of my career in the Middle East. Uh, I speak Japanese. I speak Chinese Mandarin. There are 
particular issues in that part of the world where at one point in time, I sort of knew more about them than most other people sure. in the State Department. Sure. But all of that was thrown away because I embarrassed them with, uh, with this book. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> well, so l- let me do a little bit of work here for you because part of the reason of having you on is is to help sell books, to help you know regain sure. some of the things that the government tried to take from you. I will say this too, because we had a similar experience, and, and like you said, different maybe schools, but we're on the <laughs> same playground all the time. And one of the advantages I had is I got to go out and look at what actually was happening. So like one of the things was these uh, stupid uh, greenhouses that everybody <laughs> was handing out. And I, I had a pretty long, I don't know, maybe like a, a several week long ability to go out and talk to farmers about these things. And, and uh, there was an ag, U.S. ag guys like, yeah, we're going to bring in fruit trees. This is going to be the thing that's going to enable uh, more jobs to come in because they're going to have so much more fruit. Once we do this, we're going to have them grow it in the greenhouses. So I go talk to the farmers and I'm like, do you need a greenhouse? And the guy's like, uh, we've been growing food on the side of the Tigris for several generations. We have a ground crop. Above that, we have like a tree crop. We already, already have fruit trees thanks and then above that i have dates and that creates sort of a natural greenhouse thing uh i I don't need that but the guys inland do so i went and i talked to them and i I asked the guy by the way would you know how much yield do you need before you have to go and hire like migrant workers or whatever and he's like (laughs) i would never hire anybody outside of my family if whatever size my crop is and he just kept laughing he's like i'm gonna hire my cousin if i do anything i'm not gonna i'm i i'm a farmer it's a good year for me We'll spend more time in the field picking. Like So this whole theory that we're going to create, all that was nonsense. And the same problems, and this is not a surprise to you, Peter, but the same problems existed when I went to Afghanistan. And every time I encountered the State Department, the open arrogance. Uh, so I'm going to tell you another real quick story. This is I was in south of Iraq now, down in one of the lower uh, provinces. And I just happened to be in like, at, like the, the higher army level above brigade audience. This is like where there's generals in rooms and they aren't the mm-hmm. highest ranking guy in the room. So I, I, I forget how, but I end up in this in this meeting and they're talking about the Freedom Tower they're going to build. Like we have to get the Iraqis to understand that we've done things for them. And, you know, the, the, <laughs> the commanding general wants to know like, you know, should we actually spend a million dollars on this Freedom Tower? And so, uh, you know, oh, and the ambassador's coming down. That's right. Yeah, the ambassador's coming down. Oh, we have to be very careful because we have to have everything set up so that he's not upset and all this concern about the ambassador and care for his arrival and people prepping and taking notes and the ambassador, the ambassador. All these other things are going on in this meeting. And, um, you know, and you know how the army meetings are. There's kind of a protocol. Anybody can participate, but you better know how to participate if you do. And I'm an outsider, so I'm just sitting back in my, my several row back seat. And, you know, they're like, all right, uh, so we want to try to figure out this Freedom Tower, if we, we should build it or not. And, uh, you know, we got to make a decision here pretty quick. Um, I, I'll open it up. Like, what is it? Does anybody have any thoughts or questions? So I put my hand up because I'm Mr. Practical <laughs> in the back. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, you. And I'm like, has... Anybody asked the Iraqi governor what he wants? That was the question no one was ever allowed to ask. Has anyone asked the Iraqis? Yeah. Is this important to them? Because I already know what's important to those guys. Because I've been talking, not to these ones in particular, but I've talked to them enough to know that, like, mm, how about, so this goes back to where we were out in Baghdad in the uh, farming area. Take these greenhouses, and I go and I visit the, uh, the, the little district governor out there. I'm like, hey, mm-hmm. uh, I want to ask you about greenhouses. He's like, I wanted to ask you guys about them too. Um, could you guys st- stop giving those out? Or I mean, <laughs> maybe let me give them out. And I know that seems weird, but here's the thing. Everybody, I deal with your guys' greenhouse problems more than anything else. I got lines of people asking me how to get them, complaining that other people have them. The people that have them, I never can get them to come in and talk to me. I spend a lot of time dealing with greenhouses. It's not helping me. It's making yep. my job harder. And I'm like, oh, I'll write that down in my book. So thank you for blowing the whistle and taking all that stuff on, man. I, I know it's hard and I know most of your peers behind you weren't able to do it because you know, they made it expensive um, and, and hard to do. And uh, you know, that's no fool. And like you're like a combat casualty with this stuff and <laughs> we've got to get better. If we're going to go do this work, we've got to get better. I wrote a whole thing on Ann Smedginghoff and, and when she died, Oh my! 
Oh my. I don't know if you read my thing, but I specifically had gone out with a partner of mine and we did some very, very good work on education in that area and what was and wasn't acceptable. And the Ministry of Education said under no terms should Americans be giving books to kids. It's wrong. It's dangerous. It's going to get someone killed, including kids. Everybody, Peter, everybody had access to that report. We published it to the State Department people. She wasn't there when we were there, but six months later, she was dead because no one bothered to say we shouldn't do this and ignored the Ministry of Education, the religious leaders. If that was the reason that they were out, and we both know that they were out there getting pictures and ignoring the threat that was in the area, she didn't have to be dead from that. It, it, it's tragic. And uh, for the, those, I mean, Anne was a, a very uh, junior State Department officer who was, I think, on her second, first or second assignment out in Afghanistan, and she was blown up by the Taliban in the process of arranging a photo op yeah. for a visiting VIP. And uh, there are so many bad reasons to die, but honestly, dying to do a photo op to present a U.S. government program as falsely successful yeah. has to be among the most w useless of deaths. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I had to wait a while to be respectful to her family and everything else because she certainly, she's not supposed to know, you know, yeah. and, and, and Secretary Kerry was never able to be honest on that, but she died no. for a dumb reason, and she may have still died that day no matter what because it's a dangerous place, but uh, that... That's not how we do diplomacy. It's just not. No. Terrible. No. Yeah. All right. Well, I've had you for about the amount of time I said, and we haven't covered anything yet. So um, I'm going to have to ask you back at some point. But, I think that would be great. Yeah. No, this is great because we can have these conversations. This is one of the fun things. Is I get to have people on that actually have a voice, can talk honestly, especially now, and uh, and really have a conversation that the next time we decide to go do one of these things, hey, I'm all for it. Let's go do it. But Here's one of the things I learned, and I'll, I'll say this, and, and I'm going to try to shut up, <laughs> but I don't know. It's not if the Americans win hearts and minds. Can you help the government gather the hearts and minds? Can they develop legitimacy? You can be as trained as you want. Your cops can do hand-to-hand -hand combat and intravenous injections and all kinds of things, but if no one's going to call them, you've lost. And that's the thing, is we kept finding a focus for some reason on them liking us. It's that's not important. Did you find a similar thing from your experience? Absolutely. The, the, the lessons here are, are not particularly hard to, to, to discern if you're willing to, 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 to look for them. In fact, almost every mistake we made in Iraq was a duplicate of mistakes that we had made in Vietnam, where we ran a similar hearts and minds campaign. In fact, that's where that phrase hearts and minds comes from. Right. And in f every mistake that we are in the process of continuing to make in Afghanistan could have been corrected if they'd looked at the examples from Iraq. And I, I hope that whatever the outcome is in, in Syria, that we don't make the same mistake of trying to, to go in there and rebuild and reconstruct and win over hearts and minds. It seems like the current administration has no, no stomach for that. And whatever else we can say about them, we can say that we're glad that they aren't going to plunge the United States into that reconstruction effort because it does nothing but take money that should be going to building bridges and roads in the United States and spend it on building bridges and road, roads in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria that they don't even need. Never yeah. mind the waste of our taxpayer money. And, and uh, as a guy that's seen all the buildings a year later, aren't standing, <laughs> aren't are unsafe. This is like a brand new building here. What the hell? You know. So it's, it's impressive if they were standing at all a year <laughs> a year later, because oftentimes uh, we didn't get what we paid for, oh, and yeah. uh, we were so willing to look the other way that we got our comeuppance eventually. But it wasn't what we paid for. All right, well, you guys can track Peter's work at WeMentWell.com. You can definitely interact with him on Twitter at WeMentWell. He definitely is approachable. You guys should definitely try to get either any of his books, but I, I especially like the, uh, you know, the one about Iraq because it's, it's, it, it mirrors my experience in such a way that it's just like, man, we've got to do more. To, to, if we're going to go do this kind of work, let's at least not do that. 
you know, do try something else and get that wrong, but let's not keep doing the same thing we were doing. So thanks again, man, for having me on on a Friday evening for you. It means a lot to me to be able to have these conversations. Pete, it is my pleasure, and I would be happy to come on back and talk some more about all these things. And it's fascinating for me to hear about uh, your work in Afghanistan and how that mirrored some of the things in Afghanistan, in, in Iraq. There's a book waiting to be written uh, about the reconst- failed reconstruction efforts in Afghanistan. And if you are got a little free time, I'd commend you to, to put pencil to paper and see what you could come up with. I'm trying, man. I'm trying. It's hard. It's hard to do it. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you.